And now we're going to talk about options. The objective of what we're going to do is to understand an option price in terms of the stock and bond price. This is pure relative pricing, not explanation. As you saw, most of the uses of the Fama French model were relative pricing. Understand some new thing given the HML premium. This is going to be a pure version of that sort of thing. Most applications of finance are, in fact, pricing one thing in terms of other things rather than deep arguments about rational versus behavioral. The method is, as uh, you might not be surprised, we're going to use prices expected discounted payoff, just as we have all along. And we're going to learn about the discount factor from stock and bond prices rather than uh, learning about the discount factor from utility functions, consumption, state variables, and so forth. Uh, I like that approach because it, it unifies our thinking about asset pricing. I think it's also the right way to approach modern asset pricing. The traditional approach is to emphasize arbitrage. But if, if, you could, if you could purely price by arbitrage, the new securities wouldn't be there in the first place. And most uh, current option pricing has market prices of risk here and there. So we might as well think about it in the same framework as we think about everything else. So how do we do price is expected payoff asset pricing? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to understand the payoffs. So what are the payoffs that option prices, that options give you? What is the value at capital T the date the options expire? So let's meet the basic players. A call option is the one we'll study the most. It is the right to buy a stock at the strike price uh, at the given date. So the payoff, the value of the call option, is this, uh, is this bent line. Uh, it's nothing if the stock ends up at capital T being less than the strike price. If the stock is greater than the strike price, the right to buy the stock at the strike price is worth the difference between the stock price and the stock price. That's the payoff. Do not confuse payoff and profit. The call option, it costs something to buy this option. So the profit is the payoff minus the initial price. And I've driven, drawn that in red. The, the, but we will, we will be using the payoffs almost always, not the profit. Don't con, uh, confuse those two. Another common option is the put option. This is the right to sell a stock at a high price. That right is obviously worth something if the stock price falls. So there's the payoff, and there is the uh, profit from the put option strategy. Similarly, as, as well as buying them, you can write them. So writing a call option is just the negative. It's, uh, it's a strategy that ha always has a negative payoff. Why would anybody do something with a negative payoff? Well, because you collect the call option price ahead of time for writing that, that security. And similarly, there is the strategy to writing put options. You can have a lot of fun with options mixing all of these different things together and achieve all sorts of interesting uh, strategies, interesting contingencies of how much money you get depending on where the stock price ends up. Let me show you two that I think are, are very much worth thinking about. <laughs> the first one is buying disaster insurance. Suppose you are a bank or a, 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 a big investor of some sort, you're holding the stock, so green is S, that's your payoff from holding a stock portfolio. But you're worried about what happens if stocks go down and we might lose all our money. Well, let us think about buying a stock and also buying a put option. It's called a protective out of the money put option. If you do that, your total payoff is now this hockey stick line. You still have the stock, but then if things go terribly, you've capped your losses. Of course, that costs you something. You have to pay for that put option. So your profit is dragged down a little bit. Your, your performance in good times is dragged down a little bit. But you've bought insurance at that premium against extreme losses. That would be a great strategy for, for example, we did a problem of investors with habits that didn't want to lose more than x amount. Well, investors like that could buy this protective put option and make sure that disaster never happens. Might be useful for banks. Uh, an investor who has borrowed a lot of money might want to buy put options to make sure that they, uh, that, they, that they will always be able to pay off their money. And of course, when we refer to bailouts as free put options from the government, we are referring to banks that don't want to pay that premium and can collect that in the form of bailouts. 
The objection, of course, is that it's expensive. You have to pay that premium. That's why lots of companies don't like to uh, buy protective put options and instead dream up the idea that they'll be able to sell on the way down or someone else will come to the rescue or this will never happen and so on and so forth. But the idea of, writing, of buying an out-of-the-money put option is a very useful idea for thinking about all sorts of events in finance like that. On the other side of this transaction, writing out-of-the-money puts is another strategy that's very interesting to think about. What happens if you are the writer of this out-of-the-money put option that this institution bought to hedge their losses? Well, I drew in, in both cases, a suggestive bell curve of, of where stocks might go since they're out-of-the-money options that only come in in the extent of huge losses. If you take this strategy on, almost all the time you will pocket the put option premium and the option will expire and nothing will happen. You will generate a little bit of profit almost always. And then every now and then the disaster happens and you have a very small probability of a huge loss. Here is over time what the profits of that strategy look like. Make money, make money, make money, make money, huge loss. Picking up nickels in front of a steamroller is how one hedge fund manager calls it. Of course, you have to get out of the way of the steamroller, which turns out to be very difficult to do. You've seen this kind of profile in many, many strategies that have blown up. Uh, over the years, and you can see the temptation to tell your investors about this part and to not let them know or not really be honest about the fact that there are these huge losses out there. You can make your performance look very good for many years in a row by writing out of the money put options. That's just a little taste of all the exciting possibilities you can get uh, by combining options. Our question, here is the call option, is we want to understand the option price and I've drawn in roughly what the option price looks like. Now, why is it here at the money? Why the, Here, if you exercise the option right now, it's worth nothing because the stock is the same as the strike price. Why are people willing to pay for something that is worth nothing today? Well, it's not worth nothing today because the stock might go up and it might go down. If the stock goes up, it becomes worth something tomorrow. If it goes down, it's worth, it's, it's worth nothing, but it can't be worth less than nothing. So a chance of going up, it's like a lottery ticket, is worthwhile. You can see that the price is going to be more valuable. The longer you have, the greater chan the chance of the stock ending up here, and the more volatile the stock is. Those are going to be ingredients in the price. And once we know the price, we can take derivatives, calculate deltas, and other ways of, of knowing um, how to hedge uh, other instruments, how, what the sensitivity of, this, of the option is with respect to stock price. So that's why it's an exciting idea to, to be able to find the prices of the options. Why do we have options anyway? Um, options are, I think, this is a bit of speculative history, <laughs> they're an ideal trading vehicle. If you know something and you want to buy a stock, but you don't have a lot of money, you want to borrow money to buy the stock, but I'm not going to lend you money to buy stock because you might pay, not be able to pay me back. Well, I could write you a, a call option instead. Now, if it goes up, you make a ton of money. If it goes down, you, you, don't, uh, you, you, you can't welch on that bet because you don't owe me anything if, if it goes down. And it provides a tremendous amount of leverage. Suppose the stock is at 100, the call option price is 10, and at the money, uh, an at the money call option, the, the slope there is about a half. So that gives you a beta of five on your investment. You can get a, a five times leverage with no probability of loss of not being able to pay your debts by buying call options. It can't default. So it's an ideal way to write a contract with people who want to do trading on information and don't have a lot of money. Today, options are useful uh, in addition to their tra use in trading because they're so useful for hedging, for creating all the kinds of strategies that I, I discussed above. Well, let's get on to business, which is to understand what the price of the call option is given the stock and bond uh, using as much arbitrage uh, and, 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 and uh, utility-free arguments as we can.